first item on the agenda and probably most of our agenda today is having the region directors report on what's going on in the region. We typically have been doing these um, throughout the year leading up to our programming workshop. And what we've asked the region directors to do is report on a project they're doing in each of the areas of our goals and a project related to quality of life. And we have also asked them to report on how they're using their contingency money. So the contingency money, they get to decide how they use that throughout the year, but then they do a, a report to you guys to make sure you understand what they're doing with it and um, understand how they're using it. So um, with that, I think I looked in the, I, I peeked at the presentations and it looks like we're going to go in order of regions. Does that sound right? Yes. So, that, and, and it's not very helpful, but I'll say that Rob's going to go first, but... Region Region One, Rob. Like, if you want to, if you want to take it away. Well, may I ask everyone in a favor? If you're not a presenter, would you please mute your mics, so we don't have the echo, we don't have any kind of distractions. You can turn it on. We ask questions, please. Thank you. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, it's good to be with you, Commissioners, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm excited to talk about uh, some of the things that have been going on in Region 1, um, and uh, specifically our contingency projects and transportation solutions projects, uh, and how they kind of relate to our goals. Uh, I'd first like to say that I, how much we appreciate the, the contingency and the transportation solutions projects. As a new Region Director, this is a great way to be able Rob, to... can you get a little closer to your mic? I'm having trouble hearing. Okay, this is a great way to get. Uh, is that better, Com Commissioner? Can you hear me better now? That is better. Thank you. Okay, I, I was speaking. I was turning my head away from the mic. So uh, I, I just appreciate these these two funds. I know when I was at the region before, obviously transportation solutions wasn't around, and so. This has been very helpful as a region director to address some of the needs. Here's a quick list of all the contingency projects. It's on the presentation that you guys have. I'm not gonna go dig into each one, but uh, one of the things to notice is how many of these are partnerships with cities or counties or other agencies. And I see these contingency projects as an opportunity to partner with, our, uh, with, with communities and with uh, other agencies uh, in the state. So I'm going to highlight uh, one of these, and this is one that you're very familiar with, and it's the uh, US-89 break check area. This was done uh, because of the uh, safety issues with trucks going down that grade. So this is definitely meets one of our goals, which is uh, zero fatalities. And unfortunately, there was a fatality uh, of the truck driver in one of these situations where they crashed into the um, Buildings down at the bottom of uh, of the grade there at, in Garden City. So uh, anyway, this was a this was a opportunity that we had to uh, install this brake check area and the signing to be able to uh, help trucks stop and take take a do check their brakes, see how they were doing before they headed down the grade. You're going to see tomorrow in commission. Uh, a project that we're adding to the, the one that we did at the top of the canyon is pretty small. And so uh, we're adding another one lower that has a little bit more space. So more trucks can pull over at once. And we're, we're going to be coming to the commission tomorrow and asking for that. So that's kind of a continuation of improving the safety uh, in this particular area. The second one is uh, that I want to talk about is a study. And uh, sometimes you think of studies as, you know, what, what's the purpose? And, and I, I think that uh, improving the quality of life through this corridor, this is a concern I think a lot of regions have. And, and I've noticed that it's become more evident to me as I've uh, become a region director in Region 1 that um, the UDOT road, the state road, is also Main Street. And it's a Main Street, SR 126 is a Main Street uh, for many of these cities in Davis and Weaver County. And so this, I'll, I'll give credit to Lisa here. Lisa started this study when she was up there and we're just finishing it right now. And we're looking more than just at traffic operations, although it says that in the study, we're also looking at pedestrian safety, 
uh, coordinating with the master plans for the cities. And I think these studies are a great way for us to get a plan together, working hand in hand with the cities and the communities in that area. And then the, the, um, the outtake of this is going to be, we're going to come up with a, and we're, I actually just looked at this before I, I got on, but uh, a corridor plan, a corridor agreement with all of these cities that this is the way we're going to move forward. And it gives the city some flexibility to do what they want in their particular city. Uh, but it also uh, is, a, is a big picture look and try to, to, to maintain some consistency on what we're doing throughout the entire corridor. So here's uh, moving into our transportation solutions projects. And as you know, this is these projects that we have a little bit more money in this. Uh, typically it's 10 to 12 million is what we see, although it varies from year to year. But this was one of the, the projects that uh, was chosen last year for transportation solutions. I know Commissioner Barlow, uh, we, we got to visit the uh, opening of this and uh, that's very near your, your, your place of residence. This is uh, again, a, a project that, that is uh, meeting our goal of zero fatalities here and uh, has been you know, in, in place for well, since September, October timeframe. So uh, this was a, a great opportunity for us to, um, to improve safety on this particular route and deal with a specific safety issue. Um, this next one is the legacy highway cable barrier in various locations. In 2019, when the speed limit was increased on legacy and trucks were allowed, several of the communities came to UDOT with a concern that the trail was, uh, was so close and with trucks and higher speeds on this particular uh, roadway that they were felt unsafe on the trail. And so UDOT partnered with uh, Salt Lake, North Salt Lake, Woods Cross, Bountiful, Centerville, and Farmington uh, to uh, look at these locations where the trail was, was closer than uh, was between 30 and 50 feet away from the roadway and there was no existing berm. And we installed cable barrier or guardrail at each of these locations to uh, continue to make that trail an amenity to those communities. I know uh, many of the transportation commissions that I attended, uh, many of the citizens spoke up about, about that trail and the importance of the trail, the quality of life. And so uh, this is a project where we, we took some money, we took about $733,000 out of our transportation solutions and, and installed guardrail and, and cable barrier. This is one that's uh, up in Smithfield in, uh, in, in Cache County on US 91. Uh, there was, uh, this, uh, this is uh, in our preserved infrastructure goal. And the outside of this box covered or the shoulder was, was beginning to fail in this particular area. And so we use some of our transportation solutions to go in here and, and put a project together. This, isn't, this one is still being planned and designed and it will be constructed in 2021. This is another safety improvement and also deals a bit with quality of life. This intersection uh, prior to this construction had several crashes because of some sight distance issues. One of the cross streets was low and it was hard to see. Uh, there were some utilities in the way and a canal, uh, the parapet to the canal box was in the way. So it was difficult to see. And so uh, we, we went out in, uh, and uh, extended that canal box as you can see now, we've raised the grade there so that there's a lot better sight distance. So uh, we've improved the situation out there that was a safety problem in the past. And so uh, this is again, partnering with, with communities, looking at safety issues and, and working on those to make sure that we're, we're making the community a, a safer and a better place to be. And uh, that is all I have for our transportation solutions and our contingency projects. Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Questions don't cost any money. Well, you must have done a good job, Rob. Nobody has questions. Thank you. Okay. This is Commissioner Barlow. I just had a comment. I, I take it that we haven't had a truck use the new truck runaway ramp uh, coming down the hill to Bear Lake. 
we have, to my knowledge, we have not yet. Right after it was installed and before we went out to the uh, opening, we did have a vehicle enter in and just hit that first gate. But uh, it was, they were a little confused on where to go. And it, luckily it was a pretty minor fix uh, and nobody was hurt, but uh, we haven't had a truck go in there yet. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, can you guys see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Let me get back to that window. Is it in presentation mode now? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'll echo what, what, R1 was talking about with uh, transportation solutions and contingency. It really is good opportunities for us to be able to partner with the community. Um, so I'm gonna go through it kind of reverse order. I think of what Rob had done and talked about contingency last. Um, Region two has uh, a pretty diverse program. Uh, we've, we've got a, a huge selection of projects all the way from really, really relatively small projects up to, you know, mega type of projects. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I highlighted some of the smaller projects that we have as well as the larger projects. And when talking about um, the strategic goals and how we're meeting those, um, I think it's important to recognize that we do have small projects that are really, really narrowly focused on goals as well as the larger projects, which sort of encompass um, all of the goals, hopefully. So the first project I just wanted to highlight is, is one of these smaller projects related to our zero, our zero goal. Um, this is a project for uh, on Bangor Highway for some barrier um, residents. And this is just north of 114 South. Residents along this corridor back in April of 2020 came to the department with concerns of, of uh, the community and wanted some concrete barrier placed in this area. Now, the reason that they did that was because we'll advance, because a, a car hit that decorative wall and you can see um, we it was sort of lucky in that it didn't come down this slope, but um, this is a, this is a major concern for the residents obviously in this area. And so, um, the department was able to put together a project using transportation solutions. Very, very easy, easy project. Um, $200,000 worth of barrier to put out here, but um, to help alleviate some of the concerns with these um, houses. I'll also note that, you know, this is actually taller than this wall, so it probably gives a little bit of noise, a little bit better noise than even these decorative walls. Um, so, Shifting now to mobility, a, a project for mobility. This is one of the large projects. Um, northbound I-15 currently carries about 150, 150,000 vehicles per day. It's projected to be 200,000 vehicles per day in 2040. Um, and this is sort of the, the flow that we saw on northbound I-15 during the AM commute. And you can see that it backs up um, all the way back to 123rd Bangor Highway, creating a, a lot of delay. Um, so the, the concept of this project was to add a lane and to provide a CD system, a collector distributor system for the traffic that, that goes to I-215. And, and so the concept here is to take the traffic for I-215 off the system before it has to uh, create that weave with 90th South um, on ramp there. And so as you can see this, this is looking, this is looking north. This is the CD system. Um, so it, it removes traffic for, for I-215 before 90th South and runs parallel to I-15 all the way up there. Um, and 
it was the CD system was open on February 7th. And I just wanted to show this as far as success. Um, this blue line represents the, the, the delay, the travel time in minutes of um, the area around the CD system before COVID. This, the orange is sort of the, the COVID numbers that we've seen the reduced traffic. We opened up the CD system and you can see that it's taken that delay all the way um, away from I-15. And this is even without that um, additional lane being open. Now, this is only two days worth of data here, but uh, from the numbers that we have, we're currently running at about 93, 94% of the traffic that we saw um, prior to COVID. And so we're approaching those volumes that were were, that were pre-COVID and we're seeing this sort of, um, of travel time variation. So very successful project. Um, along to preserve the infrastructure goal, I wanted to highlight a couple of sort of smaller projects. The first is the I-215 overhead sign replacement. This is a transportation solutions project. Uh, as you can see, a lot of the signs along I-215 have reached the end of their useful life and they needed to be replaced. This is about 50 signs on uh, six different structures. And one of the huge benefits of this uh, project was that is the new type of sign sheeting that we're gonna be using uh, is high reflective, which will eliminate the need for these overhead lights to, to, to reflect off of the signs. So that's, that's, that, was, uh, that began earlier this year and will continue through the, through the rest of this 2021 season. The next project is for on long to preserve the infrastructure is this I-80 barrier replacement. Um, you guys are probably fully aware that um, there's a new set of crash criteria standards called MASH. That's because the uh, average height and the average weight of a vehicle on the roads today is higher height and a heavier, heavier car. Um, the heavier car sort of surprises me when I think of my grandmother's 1976 LTD, which was like a tank, but the data proves that out. We are driving taller, heavier cars. And as a result, a lot of the, a lot of the barrier that we have um, needs to be, uh, is, is out of date, needs to be replaced. And so this project replaces, I think, about 30,000 feet of barrier along this section. Um, related to quality of life project, um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to show the, the one that probably high, is the greatest reflection of, of our mission um, to improve quality of life, and that's the Mountain View Corridor project. The, you guys are no stranger to these projects of Mountain View Corridor. The, the nice thing about this one, or the, the exceptional thing about this one, is it's, it is the last tie to SR201. And so when, when we talk about the aspects of quality of life um, that, we're, that we're trying to improve, uh, better mobility is the first. And this, this actually provides the missing link to SR201, um, which allows people now to go west on SR201 and then head south, which will improve east-west mobility throughout the valley, not just, um, not just along 201. Uh, good health is the second aspect. Uh, this is this is a remarkable trail system that was installed as part of this project. It's 27 miles worth of uh, pedestrian and bicycle trail, and this project uh, put in six bridges for this trail so that there's to to eliminate the conflict of bicycle and pedestrians uh, on some of these these major roads. Um, uh, the the uh, the, the connecting the communities uh, aspect of quality of life. I don't know that we've had a, a project that's better worked with communities to ensure that uh, the connectivity with communities is existing and strong economy as well, you know, with mobility and all of these other things come strong economy. So there's that. Shifting gears to the contingency projects, um, like Rob had mentioned, um, we do have quite a bit of studies that we're taking part of as, with the contingency funds. I'm gonna highlight three of these projects uh, that, that uh, we had this last year. The first is the is widening SR210 uh, at the Grit Mill parking lot. So this is, this is at, uh, in uh, Little Conway Canyon at the 
at the parking lot here. This was a project that was done with the WFRC, with the US Forest Service, with Salt Lake County, with the Salt Lake Public Utilities. Um, and I think our, our, our contribution to this added a left turn lane to get into this parking lot. The second one I wanted to highlight is SR224 MARSEC VMS. This was done in partnership with Park City. And this is a VMS that's put in place in order to alert um, Park City residents of road closures in the area. And the last project I wanted to highlight from Region 2 is this uh, wildlife fencing. This again was done in partnership with SPSW uh, to install wildlife fence in Summit County between uh, Kimball's Junction and Jeremy Ranch. So with that, I will entertain any questions. Not questions so much as um, comments. Uh, Robert, R2 is how I have you listed on my paper here. Um, I appreciate the immediate response to the to the barriers to that particular neighborhood along Bangor Highway. I remember when we talked about that and here it's already solved. And so um, having transportation solutions, listening to uh, the community and then solving that problem, I think is really awesome. I also appreciate in the presentation the way you're helping to remind us um, how these projects relate back to our uh, quality of life framework. So that's, I, I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I should have, I should have led with this, um, but I'm, I'm sitting in this chair um, and, and taking credit for work that's done with everybody be in, in front of me, right? So Lisa, uh, Carmen, Brian Adams, uh, have been remarkable. And so I just hope to be able to ride their coattails a little bit longer. Natalie, do you have a question? Good morning. Hi, Nagy. Nice to see you. Rob, thanks for the report. I, it's always really helpful. My only comment doesn't really have to do with the report, so I could save it for later. I, I, at some point in this, I was hoping to get just a little update on what's going on in Little Cottonwood. There's a lot of chatter about it. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from Robert? Good job, Robert. Thank you. Okay, can you all see the uh, the presentation? Yes. Okay, good. All right, it's a it's a pleasure to be here um, with uh, with you this morning and, and talk about Region Three and how we've used transportation solutions, um, tap and contingency funds um, to work for you know partnering solutions and to work for success in, in communities. And I, I just want to um, preface this like like Rob and Robert have have already mentioned and, and just say how critical these programs are in helping us uh, work with, with communities to solve problems, be nimble, like Commissioner Gochner just mentioned, our Commissioner Law. And I, I, I just really um, appreciate these programs and, and what they allow us to do to, to, to work with communities. Um, just as a, a preface, I, I wanted to uh, remind the commission how Region 3 is organized. We, we have project managers assigned geographically in, in areas that um, remain constant. And so the communities in these areas know who their consistent contact is and we're able to uh, meet with them regularly and, and, and develop um, relationships and create uh, that, that working relationship and trust that you need to, to, to be effective in, 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 uh, you know, in a professional setting. So it's really working well for us. And um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of success from, from this approach. First pr project that I wanna talk about, you, you're familiar with, cause we addressed it not long ago in commission meeting, but we used um, transportation solutions funds to address a, a developing issue on US 191 north of Vernal, and that is the growing popularity of the Moonshine Arch. Um, that area uh, has seen visitation rise significantly to the point where they, they, they are actually developing a, a project at the trailhead to um, uh, define some parking and, um, and add signing. The county has added wayfinding signing to this location. Visitation is, is rising significantly. You can kind of see 
well, aside from the, the natural beauty there, um, it's an awesome place to visit if you have a chance. But you can see on the inset that the access to that that road that um, attraction is not great, being on the, on a curve. And um, the concept is to move the access to the straightaway. The county would realign the the dirt road that approaches it, and then we would add um, a, a left turn lane and um, signing to to direct folks to to uh, to to the to the arch you can kind of see in this and these photos the existing access is up by that white truck that's that's off on the shoulder you can't even see the access road you, you just have to kind of know that it's there um, and the idea would be to uh, move it to a, a location on the straightaway where it's it's very clearly defined and and we, we would put a left turn lane there so that you could make the turn out of the flow of traffic. We see that as a, an improvement both for zero um, fatalities and also a quality of life issue as, as it's a, a, a popular destination for hikers and families. Um, the next one uh, is, a, is a, a TAP project that we worked with um, Goshen City, Goshen Town and um, with MAG. You can see on the, uh, the map on the right, um, Goshen has uh, put a plan together to use Center Street as a as a trail corridor to connect the north side and the south side of their of their city um, their city is kind of bisected by us6 and us6 is a wide road through goshen and um, in talking with them they they desired to um, address the the safety uh, of crossing us6 especially in light of of the uh, the there, there's a school just north of us6 and um, and the concerns were um, getting people across safely and, and have them feel like that's a, a good experience. And, and so we work with them to develop a solution um, where we were adding some um, curb extensions that will reduce the, the distance that's required to cross. It will also help with the crossing guard. We'll have less distance to, to, to cover in, in helping um, protect the kids across that, that crossing. And it's going to uh, connect the north and south side of the sides of their communities. So we actually have a resurfacing project that's going to address pavement on US-6, and we added the, uh, the, the TAP funds to that project to address this, this need that we also see as zero, uh, zero fatalities and also a quality of life issue. Next one I want to talk about is, um, is in Payson. The uh, I-15 interchange is just off the, uh, the, the map there to the north. Um, this is the intersection that's right by McDonald's, if you're familiar with it. The existing intersection is three-legged. The, the, the future 600 North extension that's noted there, that's, that doesn't exist yet. The signal, th this intersection war warranted a traffic signal. Um, we know in, through discussions with Pace and City that um, they, had they have a desire to uh, make this a four-legged intersection and kind of address some of the access issues that are going on in this area. And um, so we used $120,000 of contingency funds to, uh, to help um, design that future uh, intersection to, to make sure that we uh, could install the signal now because it's warranted now, but do it in a way that's forward compatible with the road when, 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 when it gets addressed by the city. And so um, they were appreciative of, of our willingness to help in that way and, and, and help um, do some effective planning here to make sure that, that, that we get a solution that works now and in the future. Next project I want to talk about is, is down in that same area. It's on SR 198 at Elk Ridge Drive. This is in the um, Pace and Elk Ridge area. Um, you can see on the map um, where we are in relation to I-15, the green dashed line is the future Salem Parkway that um, the county is actually, uh, they, they've got it designed. They're in the um, process of acquiring the right of way and they'll probably be building this, not this summer, but next summer. Um, this is another case though, where the signal at Elk Ridge Drive and SR 198 is warranted now and it's a, it's a busy intersection. Um, and so we, we didn't wanna wait for the construction of uh, the Salem Parkway to install that signal 
but there's the the uh, the complication of that road having to connect, and uh, again wanting the signal to be uh, to be constructed now, but done in a way that's consistent with the future. It required some um, some right of way acquisition, in which we used um, contingency funds to uh, to assist with that right of way that that would have been required with the Salem Parkway, but uh, we want to deliver this signal um, now. So the, the benefit of this is that we'll, the citizens will, will, will get to use this signal for an extra year um, and the safety that's, that's provided with that. Rob, before you go forward, in these two locations for the signals, you talked about the warranted. Could you please give us some kind of standard or some kind of basic, well, how you calculate for the signal requirements at this sure. time? Sure. Yeah, without getting too uh, nerdy about it, there, there's a, a series of considerations that are made, basically um, looking at different ways that the traffic conflicts with each other. So, um, you know, if you want to make a left turn, how many opposing vehicles uh, through vehicles are, are you conflicting with? And studies have shown when you when you reach certain levels that that it, it's a good idea to install a traffic signal. And, and there are other considerations, you know, um, what's happening with adjacent traffic signals, what's happening with pedestrians, the crash experience. There's a series of uh, eight to 10 of these that, that, uh, that, that you consider in um, evaluating whether a signal is warranted or not. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, next project I wanted to mention, um, this is in Orem. Um, it, it, this is right by their, their um, city center, by their, where their city offices are and their library on Center Street, State Street. Um, they're redeveloping that area. Um, in this area, we, we share a storm drain. And um, because of some changes that they were making uh, and, and with, a, with some modifications that were made through development they they were no longer able to use ir an irrigation system that was downstream and things like that we worked with them to um, come up with a solution and and shared the cost at an improvement at this intersection so that our our commingled water could could uh, function effectively into the future and so uh you know they they, they were appreciative of that and of course it, it works better for us so um, this was a, a good partnering opportunity with with uh, with the city that we wouldn't have been able to do because we wouldn't have had this money um, budgeted any other way. So we used $100,000 of contingency to help address this uh, storm drain need. Um, under optimized mobility, um, this is the intersection of uh, Pleasant Grove Boulevard and North County Boulevard. Uh, uh, Commissioner um, Kramer is familiar with this this intersection. Um, this this is a very busy location. Th this is a, a a gateway into um, northeastern Utah County from I-15. It's it's kind of the main access for uh, a lot of American Fork for um, Alpine Highland um, Cedar Hills. Um, traffic is just growing. Um, leaps and bounds, but both through development that you can see there on the picture, there's lots of open space, but also development that's occurring along North County Boulevard. And um, this was $9.1 million of transportation solutions. So this was a significant um, portion of our, our program, but uh, really needed. So we're going in and adding, uh, uh, providing triple left turn lanes um, where they're needed and enhancing um, storage lengths and uh, doing so in a way that's compatible compatible with a future project that addresses the interchange overall and um, we've talked about that in previous meetings but um, this this will be a good interim solution that will help um, address the the transportation needs there as well absolutely rob i just thank you so much there are thousands of vehicles a day going through there and it continues to expand and we've bought right away along there, UDOT has, and at the right time, it's probably tripled in value since then. So thank you again for the forward looking vision there. Much appreciated. Yeah, I appreciate that. It, it, it's been a real partnership with the community and with the, uh, the developers as well. They, they've been very open to, um, you know, uh, putting the curb lines where they need to be and, 
and helping us to really plan effectively to make traffic flow. So this has been a good experience. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Thank you. Rob, Rob yeah. you have a question on that. You know, I mentioned before, are we, are we able to flow more than one lane of traffic going on to I-15 northbound there as we go past Lou's building, or is that still pretty much just one lane? I, I, just as you, at the bottom of your picture slide there, as you're yeah. going, it's the, which is really going to the west and then going north. I, I just know you, you'll flow the traffic, and sometimes it might back up there as you're heading past Lou's to the south of Lou's building as you're going to go north on I-15. I don't know. Yeah. Is that part of this project? Yeah, that's that's one of the things that we're evaluating is ways to improve access on, onto I-15 as well. That that it, it also creates a uh, a um, a problem at the in the turn lanes because everybody tries to use the same lane that that's that's trying to get to I-15 northbound. So um, that that is one of the issues that 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 we're addressing with this project. Thank you. Yep. And lastly, I, I wanted to um, give a, a, a report on the, the way we've used contingency. We didn't get to do this last year, so if I, I've included fiscal year 2020. Um, you can see we had 32 projects in 18 communities. Um, it, we, we, this is really a program that helps us touch a lot of areas of the state and, and solve these kind of problems that I've talked about that really we would have no other way of doing. And to, just, just critical, critical. Um, a critical program. Um, this is the current fiscal year 2021 to date to the, the expenditures. Um, so far, 13 projects in 10 communities, and we've programmed roughly half. We have we have been um, a little bit cautious in programming our, our funds to date with, with COVID and, and just wanted to be responsible, but we've got uses um, identified for, for the remaining funds. So um, we just really appreciate the opportunity to have had this program and and um, um, just you know we, we think it's it, it's an excellent use of those funds. Now that's the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, okay. Well, good job, Rob. There's no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me uh, see if I can share my screen. I don't know if you can see it. You see that now? Not yet. Okay, it's coming. Yep, it's on. It's on? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, Commissioner. This is Rick Torgerson, Region 4 uh, Director. And uh, I'd like to take a little bit of time here and, and echo what the, the three Robs have said about transportation solutions and how important it is for, for our region as well. Uh, three of the four projects we'll show have transportation solution projects on it as we look at our, our strategic goals and the uh, quality of life initiatives. So first project we'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, our zero fatalities um, uh, goal, uh, injuries and crashes. Um, this is a project that uh, started back in 2018 and several of the commissioners on this board probably remember our meeting in Springdale um back in march of 2018 and it was probably one of the most liveliest uh commission meetings we've had a few picket signs and a line out the door and uh, there, there was a lot of comments at that time about state route 59 which leaves hurricane and goes down to hilldale and colorado city um, with the increased traffic uh, to the grand canyon and zions and in the easternly part of washington county uh, this road was a very narrow road and um, a lot of accidents were occurring and, and unfortunately several fatalities. Uh, since that meeting, uh, we, we completed a corridor vision study, which included a lot of the communities along that corridor and identified several projects and over the last several years of, of combined both transportation solutions and HSIP funding, highway safety improvement money to address several of the concerns and um, mainly shoulders, intersection and passing lane opportunities, both northbound and southbound. So you can see in this image here, this is a shoulder widening we've done. It's not a paved shoulder, but it is an eight foot gravel shoulder. Um, you can see what the shoulder was from the white stripe to uh, where the brake line is, uh, mainly a foot or even a less. 
and and we've made substantial improvements along this corridor over the last couple of years to the tune of about eight point three million dollars. Some of the pictures on the right side show the turning movements at uh, Main Canyon intersection, which goes out to the Gooseberry Mesa and jumps over into the town of Springdale. Um, and also some of the passing opportunities um, we've been able to accomplish to date. And we still have some more work to do out there in the upcoming years. Uh, this project really hit what we envision as, as part of the safety, highway safety program for Utah is what we call the five E's, the engineering, education, enforcement, emergency response, and everyone. When we met uh, with, the, with the community along there, and Highway Patrol and, and Washington County Sheriff's Office, they were really struggling to enforce this corridor for speeds and, and other issues just because of the lack of shoulders. They, they did not feel safe uh, for their officers being out there to be able to pull somebody over or provide emergency response uh, if an accident actually occurred out there. So really combining all of these different uh, tactics that the department has, including education, we had talked to the town of Hillville about how to educate their citizens as they're commuting into St. George for work or in the hurricane to, you know, buy by the speed limit and, and make the passing opportunities where, where they're set up to do. So we've, we've attacked this corridor with all five of these E's and feel like we're making huge progress on making this state route 59 a lot safer. Um, the next project we look want to look at is our proverb uh, for our goal, Preserve of Infrastructure, is a project that uh, was about 16 miles long, uh, $14 million, um, in, in and around Anguish in the town of Patch. Uh, so we, we looked at this in a, a multiple ways of the right treatment at the right time. So the, the philosophy of good roads cost less is, is certainly in key here, where we preserve a lot of lane miles, both on the high volume and low volume system. And we use multiple techniques to do it. The, the bottom left picture with the green uh, machine there, that's our cold in place recycle program. So this is actually recycling the existing asphalt that's there and placing it back down uh, to, to ensure that the roadway can support the future loads. And then we actually had uh, HMA and SMA, the two uh, ways to put an asphalt down on the surface on top of that. Um, then we had a a section where we did roto milling and then an asphalt overlay and then just a traditional overlay as well. So we combined all of the efforts, basically all the tools in our toolbox to preserve um, this section of roadway. Um, it also just not preserves the roadway itself. It actually protects not only the pavement, but the people as well. So during these type of projects, we're able to, to uh, include things such as ADA ramps, uh, upgrade of all guardrail systems, and, as well as updated signing and striping along the corridor. And then we did add uh, several up in Springfield uh, commission meetings several years ago, the town of Hatch came and, and really was wanting to address a three lane section in the town of Hatch. Well, there was no turning movements in the town of Hatch. It's just a small two lane road and we added transportation solutions money to this project to actually uh, put in a three lane section. So it was a very successful project for us. We finished this this year and, and you know, we got a lot of good uh, reviews from, from the locals down there of the improvements we were able to make and, and it ties into our quality of life initiative as well. Uh, for I want to highlight our exit 16 project on I-15. So St. George is to the left of this image. And the hurricane is at the bottom of the screen and then Cedar City would be to the right if you're at this intersection. So this is a $28.9 million HIF project uh, where we replace the two structures that you see right there on the, on the screen. Those are two brand new bridges. Uh, the two existing bridges that were there before were very narrow and we only had one lane each direction underneath the I-15. Uh, but this project was intended is intended to be a free-flowing system to system interchange um, to Hurricane and we get uh, half of our traffic on I-15 into St. George from this interchange is coming from Hurricane. So this is a major split for us um, where we got about 25,000 cars 
Uh, here's a little graph that shows us so we're about, this is back in 2017, but we're at 50,000 cars south of this going to St. George. And, and you can see it splits directionally between uh, I-15 North and on SR-9 going into Hurricane. So it's, uh, it's definitely a very important system for us. And we added additional capacity underneath I-15 with the new bridges, as well as ramps and mainline capacity. Uh, to improve lane maneuvering as you go down into St. George. So this is the Great Line Hill is what we call it, uh, an exit going down to exit 13 to Washington City. St. George is up here at the top, if you can see my mouse. So we now have three lanes in both directions going through the Great Line Cut. Um, additional lane width for uh, maneuvering uh, as we get this uh, heavy movement from Hurricane to come on to I-15. And then this image doesn't show because it it's in construction right now, but we actually brought the truck uh, lane further beyond this ramp or this bridge so that we can drop the truck lane after the bridge to keep trucks uh, not having to move, uh, move around this major exit point to go to SR9. So a very important project for us regionally as we see a, a tremendous growth in Washington County and out in the hurricane area. This also uh, is pushing about Four miles down the road is where the Southern Parkway connects into on SR9, so the kind of the beltway of St. George and Washington County. So this is kind of a, a major connection point over to the Southern Parkway as well. So this uh, is not Photoshopped uh, image. This is actually built. And uh, this is our quality of life project for us, but it's the Monument Valley Roundabout. So this is a, a an issue that has been brought to the governor's attention for multiple years from the Navajo Nation requesting us to do improvements at the Monument Valley intersection. So as you come into the state of Utah from Arizona right at Monument Valley, um, this is the main intersection to, to go to the, the actual uh, Monument Valley area. So we Funded this a couple years ago with transportation solutions money for $1.9 million. I think it was $2 million. We completed this this last summer and it's, it's an outstanding project uh, that really looked at the context sensitive solutions of the area and tried to fit a project in that met the needs of the Navajo Nation as well as safety and uh, the quality of life initiatives in this area. Um, this does provide additional traffic calming and improved safety. This removes all left turns at this intersection because now they have to go around the roundabout and we get uh, speeds coming into the roundabout that are that are lower than a traditional intersection. Uh, so as we said, we just constructed this and opened it this last summer. So we'll be watching this and, and seeing how this uh, helps the entire area. And it is a gateway to the state of Utah as well. So it's a very nice project, a beautiful project with Monument Valley in the background. And then for us, our uh, contingency funds this year, we've, we've already allocated $851,000 of contingency money. Uh, these are type of projects that, that we've done with it. Uh, the picture here on the right is Forest Gump Hill. So this is just on the other side of Monument Valley where most of you are probably aware if you've watched the, the show where Forrest Gump decided that he was done running and this is continuing to be a popular spot for uh, visitors and unfortunately it's a it's a big challenge for us because people want to go out on the road and take a picture right on the center line of the road and we've actually had a couple of fatalities at this location from people getting hit uh, at this section so we're we're, we put $30,000 to this now, and we're gonna increase some signage and, and try to um, help visitors know the risks that are associated with this uh, key location and, uh, and try to get them to do it. Uh, if they are gonna go out on the road to do it, uh, not on the curb where this picture is at, to, it's a little bit difficult for oncoming traffic to see when people are standing out on the road. So we're, we're making some improvements. We have, this is the first phase, if, if hopefully this works. If it doesn't work, well, we've got phase two and phase three that we may have to, to continue to, to move to to actually make this entire area safe. And, and then we've started a couple of key ones that we're working on. Another one's Bryce Canyon City Main Street improvements. This is a widening and curb and gutter sidewalk trail type connection further south of in Bryce Canyon down towards the park. 
Uh, they're putting another uh, $150,000, about a 50-50 partnership uh, with Bryce Canyon City. And then we have another uh, really good partnership with the town of Leeds, uh, drainage improvements where they're bringing some money that they went to the CIB and, and was able to receive some money from the CIB to actually help with some drainage improvements in the town of Leeds. So uh, other than that, that's our presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, we'd be more than willing to help answer them. I have a comment is all, no question. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, all of you region directors, great projects, great update for us. It helps. We're smoothly reaching statewide as we see all the work that's being done. Down there in the region four, that uh, new interchange that you're highlighted, I don't travel down there that often, but when I do, uh, I can see a big difference in that section already from the work that's been done there. I haven't been there for a month or so, but uh, it uh, we've I think we're solving a problem there that will keep us going for another year or two anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Donna. Um, I just have a couple of questions going back to the projects on highway, uh, the project on Highway 59. Again, I love that we heard it and then we we fixed it by adding the shoulder. So there's that ridge when you when you drive off the asphalt onto the gravel. Um, those that always scares me as a driver. Is that something that eventually we'll look to doing differently, or do we think that's our long term solution? So there there isn't a ridge now. It's butted straight up. So it's oh, okay. compacted, uh, compact. I mean, that picture that we showed shows kind of a little lip, but it, when it's cleaned up, it is compacted. So it is a straight shot off of the asphalt onto there. We would love to eventually add asphalt and widen that out to an asphalt paved shoulder, but uh, we don't have that money yet. So right. we feel like it was better to get the actual eight foot shoulder with compacted gravel and then uh, seek to get some more asphalt into the future. That's great. Thank you. Go ahead, Natalie. Rick, you're going to get the awards for the best pictures today. <laughs> Perfect. We tried to do that. So glad. Some of those uh, should be entered to, if it's, is it NASHTO? But anyway, to our national organizations, those are beautiful. I was able to, um, I guess, test drive some of the Monument Valley improvements uh, in November and know how neat they are. And I just wanted to comment that. I think it's really wise on the Forest Gump Hill. What you're saying is we try something, evaluate it, and then go further if we need to. Because if it doesn't improve the safety there, we need to do more. Um, we have to make it easy for people to do the right thing. And they're just going to keep doing this no matter what we do. You know, there's from what I saw, there's just no stopping the interest. It's like uh, Abbey Road in London. Everyone wants to cross that crosswalk. And so we got to make it, we got to make it safe. Yeah, it's a very interesting spot of, of people just have to get that selfie right on center line. And I met people from all over the world. So. Yeah, when I was there, I met people from all over the world. Yeah. yeah. When we went down there to announce to the Navajo Nation that we had the funding with the, for the roundabout, uh, you know, Mike Maurer and Justin, uh, Harding was there and they they wanted to run up there and get that picture. And I was like, if you guys step out in the road, I am not responsible for this. <laughs> and we met a couple of people from Poland and everything. So, I mean, it, it's certainly an area. And and Rob Rob Clayton talked a little bit about it with the, the arch up by uh, Bernal. We're seeing some areas in the state of Utah that are being found now and by social media are being shown, the images are being shown and we get heavy demand at some of these locations that we've traditionally not had that type of demand before. So social media and those images are certainly changing how people want to visit. And, and it's not the main national parks, it's all these little small areas that makes Utah so beautiful. Yeah. And I also have a comment for Rick's presentation. Both 59 and exit 16, before we did any of these projects, they were really troublesome. We had some crashes, we had some concern from the local leadership mayors and county commissioners. And I've seen the improvements personally because I drive the 59. And that's the main artery to Lake Powell, Page, and Grand Canyon. So we get a lot of RVs and visitors and tourists coming in. 
and exit 16, it used to be so quick coming off the Cedar um, from the hurricane or coming I-15 South. It was just a short time to jump in the lane to save your life. Now you have a stretch all the way to the right lane, goes all the way to Washington Parkway. You can stay on it if you want to. You can exit off if you want to. It is major improvement. Thank you for Region 4. Thank you for that vision. And if, if there aren't any other questions, maybe I can just give a little summary as to why we had the regions give these presentations. And the hope was that we could show you that no matter how small the project is or how big the project is, we're always focused on the goals. And so I think you can see how they're always tying it back to the goals and then tying everything back to quality of life. And looking forward to March, when we'll be talking about programming, we, we often talk a lot about the big projects with TIF. So there's that source of funds, um, which are the really large capacity projects. But the other programming that you guys are responsible for is the highway systems construction, which is in the neighborhood of about $150 million. And some of the programs that the directors talked about the contingency program is part of that and the past couple of years the regions have each had one in their regions and so that's what that's their job is to report back to you guys on what they did afterwards with the money so that's something that you guys set that funding amount at 1.5 million and then there's also the um, I think Robert Stewart mentioned the TAP program, which is the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is for more of our bike and ped non-motorized uh, facilities. And each region has 400,000 a year to program as part of that program. That's something that you guys also look at that whole program, see where it fits within the you know, 150 million-ish dollars. Um, and then also the Transportation Solutions which is a program I think we've had for about five or six years. And that one is, has been, um, I think that one's been transformative for the regions in terms of what they can accomplish with it. And it really allows them to react to some of those um, local things that come up that there didn't used to be a way to try to work on, on uh, taking care of problems that came up that were, you know, maybe it's, uh, 100,000, maybe it's 10 million, but it gives them a range of things that they, with those projects, they do come back to you to program, but I think it allows them to be creative about solving problems within their region when they know they've got that, that source of funds um, that they're able to come back to you and ask to program. So hopefully that gives you a little context um, in terms of what we'll be talking about in March. So Terry, you leading the next item? I believe the next item is, oops, I lost my agenda for a second there. I believe that, Ben, is this gonna be Andrea and Richard carrying this item? Yes, it's Andrea Olson and Richard Brockmeyer from our planning division. Okay. Hey everybody. Um, okay. You guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right, let me share my screen here. Okay. Everybody see that okay? Yes. All right. Um, so we wanted to just come and talk about a few uh, revisions to the, the document um, for prioritization. Um, I'm just going to summarize those and then uh, if there are any questions, feel free to um, uh, ask them as they come up or, or wait until the end. Um, so one of the changes, um, we had some incorrect weighting under the strong economy for accessibility measure and the economic development measure. Um, those were inadvertently swapped. So the update really is just to provide the correct approved weighting uh, for those two criteria. Um, the next one is a, a little bit more uh, uh, changing methodology. Uh, this one is revising the measure for the TIF active transportation model. Uh, we had previously been using Strava data uh, um, to sort of measure uh, utilization and use. 
Um, we've removed that measure and replaced it with something called the active transportation latent demand model measure. Um, there's sort of two reasons to do this. One, the, the Strava agreement that we had previously has changed uh, and the access has changed. And so using that data in the way that we had been using it previously uh, was gonna be a lot more time consuming and difficult. But also the latent demand approach looks beyond existing utilization uh, to capture potential demand. One of the, the drawbacks, and I think we talked about it with you previously with the Strava data is it really is um, a very select group of people that are using that application. So sort of self-selected um, and, and a lot of uh, bias in terms of recreation use. Um, this latent demand approach looks, um, looks more at what the, the potential demand is based on things like intersection density, land use, a lot of those combinations. And within the document, there's a link um, that you can uh, click on that sort of bolded text, uh, active transportation link demand methodology document. Uh, there's a separate document that that links to that goes through the whole methodology if you wanna dig into some of the details of, of what that looks like. And then the last uh, change is um, correcting a chart uh, in the TTIF first last mile uh, pie chart. It had an incorrect label and percentages for strong economy measures. Uh, so we just fixed that um, that little issue. So are there any questions about any of those changes? Go ahead, Donna. Yeah, just going back to the first point that you made, the 35 and the 45 swapping them, did we actually measure them wrong in the last prioritization or are we just putting, are we just correcting what's available to view? Great question. Yeah, it's a, we didn't measure it differently last time. This was um, something that inadvertently got changed when we made the updates uh, in October. Um, something didn't get caught on the track changes. They never should have been swapped, but in terms of how we've been doing it, this is, this is the weighting that you all approved uh, previously and had been in the document and for whatever reason got inadvertently changed in the, in the latest version loaded to the, um, the website. So we did prioritize correctly. It was just the way it, it's just the way that it's seen. Yeah. And just in the most recent version of the document. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? So, Mr. Chair, I might. Go, go, ahead. go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. I'm Andrea Olson. I'm the planning director at UDOT. And I guess just in the interest of um, not surprising the commission in the future, uh, Richard is unfortunately leaving us. He's got an opportunity to uh, some options elsewhere. And so he won't be with us after tomorrow. Um, he's obviously been a huge part of the project prioritization. I see Commissioner Law shaking her head and I feel the same way. <laughs> but um, he's been a big part of this process and you know, we're, we're sorry to see him go, but we do have somebody um, on staff who's been with us for a little while, who is Stephanie Tomlin is her name. She's with the planning division and she's been able to overlap uh, with Richard for a couple of weeks and, and, and she's a quick study and she's getting up to speed quickly. And so she will be the person that you see as we have prior conversations moving forward. Well, regarding Richard, motion denied. All in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Well, we're going to miss you, Richard. Well, you, you cannot be doing that. And you know Washington, D.C. is not a good place to be anyway. So you know that, right? Well, I just want to take an opportunity to say thank you to, to, to all of you. Um, it's been incredible to be uh, part of this uh, this whole prioritization process. And thanks to Carlos and Terry and Ben and Andrea for for let, letting me have this opportunity and, and for all the, the work that we've done together. Um, and and uh, I know we've come to you with a lot of information all at once, um, but this has been uh, really great. And it's um, I'm very sad uh, to be leaving. It's a, it's a great opportunity. I'm excited about it, but uh, it's bittersweet because uh, I've really enjoyed um, the opportunity that I've had and, and working with all of you. So thank you very much. Well, we're going to miss you, Richard. Good luck to you, but don't forget, the door is open. You can come back anytime. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Andrea, for that heads up. Okay, next. Should I go, Terry? Okay. All right, I am um, gonna talk about uh, an, an exciting project production to. Um, this is the uh, potential public-private partnership uh, to realign US-191 uh, in the area of the Simplot uh, phosphate mine. And um, recall that last month um, you approved a, a, the funding of the environmental document for this project and some preliminary engineering, um, a, a $2 million. So we're, we're, we're beginning to work on this um, beyond the talks. One of the other actions that um, Carlos asked us to, to follow up on is the creation of a, of a memorandum of understanding with Simplot so that we lay out what our intentions are um, to, uh, to work through this public-private partnership. Since this is not a process that is well-defined at the department, I'm not aware of another project that, that, uh, that followed this path. And so that, that's the purpose of this discussion. Um, an introduction, uh, a review of this draft memorandum of understanding and, and receive your comments. Just to let you know where we are in this process, um, we've worked with our, um, our, uh, our attorneys um, and um, we've reviewed this internally. We've worked with Simplot and their attorneys and um, Simplot is ready to, to sign this agreement if, um, if we don't get, um, if we can work out any issues with the commission. And it's a non-binding agreement in that either party can back out. So um, it stops just short of, of, of obligating um, um, funding, um, but, it, but it does a good job of laying out uh, what the intentions are. And I'll walk through that, that here. Just recall, these are the recitals of the, of the MOU. You can see on the, on the right-hand side. Um, Rob, I don't think you shared your screen. Sorry. Tells me I have it. Let's see. Working now, huh? Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Eric. Sorry about that. Um, you can see on the uh, on the map. Um, this is should be familiar by now, but there, there's the area, the roadway in red, where the switchbacks are, and the uh, proposed uh, new alignment area in the uh, yellow and black. Um, the area in red is right away that, that the department owns. The the area in the uh, yellow and black that's owned by Simplot. Um, both parties see a benefit in realigning the roadway. Um, for the road users and for UDOT, it's a safety and an operational improvement where we are eliminating the switchbacks, which have been the location of, of, of run off the road crashes historically. Um, we are uh, reducing the grade of, of the road from you know, portions of it that are maximum 8% to um, no grade on the realigned portion that would be above 5%. And um, we're adding a, a, an uphill truck climbing lane, which will help um, with capacity in the area. And of course, Simplot has an interest in, in mining the area underneath of US 191 um, in, in the current alignment. Simplot in their mining activity can um, place the materials necessary for the embankment, which, which can be rather large in places up to uh, exceeding 100 feet. Um, and that the value of that is significant, um, almost $20 million as an in-kind contribution that they're offering. And um, we also are agreeing that we will work together to uh, coordinate and plan our efforts to, to, um, to deliver this project. So here are the affirmations. These are things that have already happened. Simplot prepared a, a concept study um, in 2019. UDOT um, presented the, uh, the, the that concept um, to the commission. We discussed it with um, local 
and, and elected officials. Um, we've updated their concept um, to try to get a, a good handle on what the current cost would be. And as I mentioned, we've, we've funded the environmental documents and preliminary engineering. And that, that, that's what's happened to date. Um, and here are the intended actions. So Simplot would build the embankments through their mining activity to within 10 feet of the final grade. Um, any drainage features that, that, that the new alignment would require would be designed and paid for um, by UDOT um, and Simplot would build those in, in, in the course of their mining activity. Um, Simplot would provide access of course for UDOT um, and, and our team for environmental design and construction activities. And there's that portion of the road in, in the map you can see in the yellow uh, where it's uh, j just at the beginning of the realignment, that's Bureau of Land Management property. And um, we, we would work with the BLM through the environmental process to um, gain the necessary approvals and permits for that, that work. The parties are, are agreeing to exchange the right-of-way, the existing and future right-of-way. And um, we would, uh, the department would be responsible for building the, the final 10 feet and then we would remove the existing US 191, the asphalt and appurtenances like guardrail and siding and things like that. And that's, that's it in a nutshell. It's not overly complicated. It just uh, memorializes what the, the, the intentions of the parties are. And uh, are there any questions? Hey, Rob, this is Jim. Just uh, what the beauty of this, I've seen it, but I just, can't get over it. It's really nice that we can build this road without having to impact the people using the current road right now. I mean, that doesn't always happen. That's not always a, a benefit. The great, obviously, is uh, Commissioner Van Tassel's talked about, we have the them contributing this and uh, building it up and the $20 million value. But just the fact that we can actually do something like this without having to impact the people driving, for the most part, you know, the current road is really nice. That, that will make construction rather rather uh, easy, simplified. There's a lot of traffic through there, so that's a good thing. I, I guess really what I'd like to get is a, an indication from, from the commission uh, whether or not you have concerns with um, us entering into this agreement, this MOU. Um, and, and I don't mean to speak out of place, Terry, if, if, but I, I believe that's the, the intent of this discussion. And I, I would say this is this is not a binding agreement. It's not a commitment of money. I think we just need to make that really clear. We're not binding a future commission with this action. This is this is a memorandum of understanding. Um, as as good as we can do right now, I think is show what our intent would be in the future without binding us to anything. Exactly. I think the thing as a commission we need to remember is. Simplot is an ongoing mining operation, and, and if we wait a long period of time, we will lose this opportunity. So I think that's why we're moving forward with what we've got. We know there's going to be some funding requirements that we're going to have to, to meet. But still, all things aside, I don't know where you get a fit, almost a 50% participation uh, in most public-private relationships. So. I think it's something we want to move forward on and do. We've got a very small area that uh, I think the environmental will be accomplished fairly quickly uh, with uh, an EA, which is not always used because of the size of it, it should be. And uh, I encourage us to continue to move forward. Natalie, did you have a comment? I do not, but I'm supportive of what Commissioner Van Tassel just mentioned. Okay. Commissioner Bardo? Makes a lot of sense to me. So Terry and Rob, you said that this is non-binding. When it's going to be binding, then we can have a co cooperation so we can proceed with this project. It, it would be binding when we uh, commit the funds to, to build it. Okay. I, I think the first important step is for us to go through the environmental. And I think once we have that done, then I think we can figure out what that next step is, what the right timing is. I think the need for the 
I, I believe, Rob, the need for the money is a few years out. It is. To tie up transportation solutions, current cash is probably not something we want to do. So we need we need to, I think, get through the environmental and then figure out what would be the mechanism for the money. I think that's that's probably our next step. Okay. Well, I think that you have a nod from every commissioner, so in agreement. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rob. Terry, does that complete the agenda? That is the end of the agenda. I might just, I, I think, Carlos, maybe you had something you wanted to say, but um, maybe just let the commissioners know that the meeting for next month will probably be, once we'll get the agenda completed for the staff update, but it will likely be a three or four hour session because it is our programming workshop. And so we have a lot of materials to go through and um, this will be our, I believe our second time doing it virtually and hopefully it will be our last time doing it virtually but um so we'll kind of cross our fingers for that so expect a bit longer agenda for march for staff update okay. welcome back carlos thank you i've been listening the whole time but i've been <laughs> running up to the capitol and back again so i just uh I want to just acknowledge uh, the four region directors outstanding job really really nice job and uh i appreciate i appreciate your motion on uh, richard and uh now he uh not allowed to leave i really appreciate that uh, but you know, i want to just say thank 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 you to richard for everything he's done he's just been an amazing amazing man to work with and uh, he's really helped move this department forward so best of luck to him um, i didn't know uh natalie did you want a little update on little cottonwood canyon i only say it because so much snow has come down and we've learned so much about the avalanche dangers and i just thought it, I, it just pains me to have a commission meeting and something's really big right now and we don't get a little update on it well, thank you, Natalie. And I think, Natalie, I think it was your first meeting as a commissioner. We had a staff update up at Snowbird in the Cliff Lodge. And Mark, one of our forecasters, joined us. And uh, I was just listening to him on the radio and our entire 249 team. So that's our avalanche forecasters working both big and little. Um, just amazing men and women that have uh, been working <laughs> amazing hours to be able to keep our public safe. We uh, you know, so I'll give you an idea, Snowbird had 100 inches in the last seven days. Oh. Um, and the problem we're dealing with, and we're, we're dealing with all through the backcountry, is we're dealing with a very weak layer of snow. We refer to it, it's kind of a faceted layer of snow. It's basically because we had some snow and then we had such a long period of time with no snow where we had sun and that layer becomes unconsolidated. And it's a completely unconsolidated layer of snow. And so the heavy weight falls on top of it. And we basically have, you know, a driving force. Uh, geotechnical engineers know what I'm talking about when I say a driving force um, that really um, will allow this snow to release. And, you know, we've, we've seen avalanches in the last three days in the six to eight feet deep. That's kind of the fracture face that you can see there. These are monster avalanches. Uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon, as you've heard us say, is the highest avalanche risk road in the world by many orders of magnitude. And that takes into account not only the snow, but the slope above it, but also the amount of traffic, so exposure that goes below it. And so um, the folks that work in our uh, avalanche program, you know, we have folks stationed permanently in Little Cottonwood, Big Cottonwood. We have folks in, um, uh, in Provo Canyon. And we will move those folks around the state when we have issues like up at Powder Mountain or even uh, last year we ran some folks down to, um, we've taken people to LaSalle's or even down um, in San Pete County uh, to help solve issues. Um, Canyon's been closed uh, for a long period of time and people have been interlodged. That means they can't leave the buildings. Alta, because of the wooden structures, um, when they have to go to a ultimate interlodge, um, they actually will go to the lower floors and are, you know, kept away from the windows because they don't have the concrete structures like Snowbird has. Um, we've, um, we had a, uh, 
I'll say a, a slide yesterday. I've been in the canyon 41 years. I moved to Utah to ski in Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, we had a slide yesterday um, in a location that I've never seen slide before. Folks have said they've heard of it maybe in the 70s. Um, so it's uh, where we had two of our employees uh, located in what we've always considered to be a safe spot. And you might have seen the pictures on the on the media, uh, a snowcat and our maintenance station supervisor, Jake Brown, were hit by a slide, moved their trucks. Uh, we got them out. Um, they were caught between them that we had an avalanche forecaster watching them at the time as we're doing all the time as our snow removal activities right now uh, in the canyon. And uh, the three of them were essentially trapped between different avalanches, avalanche that had come down uh, for I think it's got to be, and I'll look at Robert, probably six hours or seven hours yesterday. It was quite a while before we were able to break through. We had to bring a bulldozer in and start work using a bulldozer to break through the lower slide. Um, the slide that actually came through um, just below Lisa Falls. If you remember that big uh, rainstorm we had in August of 19 that we had the flooding and it shut down the canyon with a landslide. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the location where that slide came through. Uh, and uh, so um, we did two missions yesterday. We uh, did a couple the day before, um, and uh, they did a, uh, we had the helicopter up today. First day we've been able to fly the helicopter and they can do some lower canyon shoots. We typically don't have to do shoots in the lower canyon because it doesn't get as much snow, but, um, and we had the visibility to be able to evaluate the results. Um, the, the crews, you know, they're, they're sitting in the, on the road, hopefully trying to see the results of the shoots during the storm. Um, they have very little limited visibility. We have detection devices to try to sense the, the slides, but until you can see it, you have a hard time telling the results. Um, right now, we've got a grader, a bulldozer, snowcats, trucks up in the canyon. Uh, trying to clear the road with the avalanches. You still can't get through Little Cottonwood Canyon um, with the avalanches that we have in place. And so a lot of trees in the debris that they're needing to work through, and that really slows down the progress. And when the slides come down, it sets up like concrete. Um, it's really tight, tight stuff. So it takes a long time to move. Our expectation is that um, our goal is we're, we're going to just announce on the media now um, that we'll um setting we think by late afternoon we think we can get there we're hoping to do it sooner um the message for our guys is schedule doesn't drive what you're doing safety drives it uh, we do have folks that are quite anxious that are up there that have been up there for a while we have folks that are missing flights we have folks that are running low on food and um i talked to the president of snowbird yesterday and they were running low on food. Um, so we understand that, but our guys are working as hard as they can to get the canyon open. So Natalie, I don't know if there was something more specific or <laughs> if that was too much. I think you gave us all that we need to answer questions if people ask us. <laughs> you know, our, uh, we've made a big effort with um, our communications and, uh, you know, we have the Twitter feed on this is where most people get their information. And um, th that has been something we've ramped up a couple of years ago. Um, we're using some of the money that um, you guys allocated to the Codwood Canyons through that recreation hotspot um, to set up that network. Um, and so that's, a, uh, that's an important aspect. You know, we're, we've been very hesitant. The guys have been hesitant to send out the message that we are trying to get it open by, you know, today. Because as soon as we say that, there'll be thousands of vehicles lined up at the mouth of the canyon with hopes of getting up there and skiing the fresh powder. Um, so we're trying to manage that expectation while still giving the folks that are in the canyon wanting to get out, needing to get out, um, the, the, the best information we have. So I don't know if Robert wants to share some pictures. Robert, well, some pictures? yeah, I, I've been efforting pictures, but let me just see if I can. Um, show right. one. I, I've got one change. of a truck being buried. Let me see if I can.
Can you guys see that on that screen? So this is this is at the top of what we call seven sisters or seven turns, some people call it. Uh, we have it labeled as a snowplow turnaround. Uh, you can see the VMS, the variable message sign there on the right. You know, typically the message we have on that sign on most days now is uh, we expect heavy congestion later this afternoon, consider leaving early is the message that's usually on that sign. But you can see the truck and the snowmobile, uh, snowcat there. Um, that's a big, that's as big a pickup truck as you can have. And uh, he was, that truck was pushed and shoved to the side. And, uh, yeah, they had to climb out the passenger side window in order to get out. The driver's side's completely buried. Um, and that just gives you, a, a, it illustrates the magnitude of snow that can come down in one of these avalanches. Um, and they were trapped in between two of them. Wow. I, 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 I've been waiting. There's a lot of cool pictures, but um, my email, just for whatever reason, is not refreshing fast enough. So. Um, maybe next time I can show you more. Okay. You know, this, you know, we've, we've made investments with your help, um, in, um, some of the avalanche control structures that we put up in the Canyon. Um, so a lot of the locations, um, we don't have to shoot artillery anymore. The guys set it off with laptops from their trucks. And we have various different devices, one device called the Gaz X. There's a, another one called an Obel X. We have Bison Towers. So three different technologies to um, initiate a, um, uh, an explosion above the snow surface that will hopefully initiate. Our goal is to initiate controlled smaller slides. Because if you don't do that and you wait till it builds up, and comes down its own, those slides tend to be the types of things that take out buildings and cars. And so that's that's our goal here is to create small controlled avalanches. So. Well, any other question from Carlos or Robert, Rob, Rick, anyone? On any subjects. Any subject. <laughs> I have one just on schedule. How long do we think tomorrow's meeting will be? Well, you know, we could we could look at the line on here. I think Nagi felt, as we talked about it earlier, that it was pretty simple items. Um, a lot, you know, the open-ended part of it is the uh, public comment. If there's any uh, active public comments, nothing as of this morning. Yeah. So. I'm going to guess, Natalie, two hours would be, what do you think, Nagi? Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. Okay. Terry, anything else? Okay. Lisa, anything from you for your department? <laughs> if not, I guess we adjourn until tomorrow, 8.30. Thank you for being with us. Appreciate your patience and get you all the questions for tomorrow. Study your materials. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Bye.